and in estimates last Order. month. Order. Senator Walsh, you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Two questions about notice, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck, and I refer to reports that advice provided by Atagi is that AstraZeneca should only be recommended for use in people aged 60 and over. I ask the minister to confirm in this place that the government, this is the first time the government has been advised in any form that the AstraZeneca vaccine should not be a preferred COVID-19 vaccine for Australians under the age of 60. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, can I advise the Senate that the Health Minister received this morning, or today, the 17th of June, um, advice from ATAGI that indicated that uh, the COVID-19 Pfizer vaccine is the preferred vaccine for those under 60 years of age. The recommendation was revised due to a higher risk and observed severity of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, in the 50 to 59-year-old age group. Than reported internationally and initially estimated in Australia, Mr. President. Now, I am reading from the Atagi advice that was received this morning uh, or today. For those aged 60 years or above, Mr. President, well, I'm, well, I'm saying that we received this advice today, Senator. Uh, so, so, for those, those aged 60 years or above, the benefits of receiving a COVID 19 vaccine are greater than in younger people, the risks of order. severe Senator outcome. Colbeck, have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister for reading out what is on the public record. The question we actually, we actually asked was whether or not this was the first time the government had, it, had been advised in any form that the AstraZeneca vaccine was not the preferred COVID-19 vaccine for those Australians under the age of 60. Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate and re-emphasise the question. I believe while the minister is specifically talking about such advice, and he did talk about the day in which it had received, to instruct him any more strictly would go to how to answer a question, which I cannot do. Um, so if the minister is sticking to the advice and the timing of it, then I believe that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my understanding, my advice is that this, this advice was received uh, and decided at a meeting of ATAGI this morning. So this is uh, when we have received this advice today, Mr. President, um, and we have at all times, through the duration of this pandemic, followed the health advice, uh, and we've taken action once we have received that advice, Mr. President. So uh, this, the, this, in, this correspondence came to the health minister from ATAGI today. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, very quickly after that advice being received, the minister has made his public statements with respect to that advice. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Uh, will the minister guarantee that the Australian government will have sufficient supplies of other vaccines to ensure all Australians who want a vaccine will be able to get a vaccine by the end of this year? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, and uh, Minister Hunt has confirmed this morning, and I'm happy, or well, this afternoon at his press conference, and I'm happy to confirm uh, that our objective remains to make available to every Australian who wants a vaccine, uh, wants access to a vaccine by the end of the year, that they have access to that vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, that's been our statement all along. Uh, that was confirmed by Minister Hunt this morning, Mr. President, and was also confirmed order. Uh, by uh, um, uh, Lieutenant General Fruin, who is also assisting with the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. So uh, we have uh, significant supplies of vaccine coming into this country, Mr. President, uh, and the objective remains that every Australian who wants a vaccine will have access to one by the Order. end of this year. Se Order. On my left, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Final supplementary. I refer to reports that Pfizer approached the government 12 months ago 
offering Australia the opportunity to be among the first nations in the world to have access to the Pfizer vaccine. Is that right? Why did the Morrison government fail to secure an early agreement for Pfizer vaccines when it had the chance? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, 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 advice, the advice that I have is that, uh, Mr. President, uh, Pfizer has at all times met the agreed delivery arrangements that they have provided to us, uh, and we have, and we consequently have real confidence in the projected, uh, projected deliveries that they are proposing to provide us through to the end of the year, Mr President. Uh, I don't have any further information with respect to uh, the reports that Senator Wong refers to. I'm happy to take that notice and come back to, on notice and come back to the chamber. Order. Order. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working to create more jobs and strengthen Australia's economy? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Henderson for that question. A, uh, a strong champion of small businesses across Australia and I know deeply concerned to ensure, to ensure the security of employment opportunities for all Australians. And Mr President, against a backdrop of enormous global uncertainty, global pandemic, the first in 100 years, uh, indeed an economic shock to the world, the greatest since the Great Depression, our government has sought at every juncture to ensure the economic security uh, of Australia and Australians and its economic recovery from the shock of COVID-19. Uh, our budgets handed down last year and this year framed the direction for our economic recovery plans to make sure that we kept as many Australian businesses as strong as possible, as many Australians in work as possible, and that we continued to grow employment opportunities wherever possible. In the face of these enormous global uncertainties, it is pleasing to see the strength across the Australian economy, Mr President. Australia's economy today is now larger than it was going into the pandemic. This is a feat that no other major advanced economy has achieved to date, to have recovered their economy to a bigger size than it was pre-pandemic. Over the last three quarters, we've seen some growth of 8.7 per cent, the strongest growth in Australia in more than half a century, Mr President. And today we have seen the dividend that that creates for Australian and Australian workers, with the unemployment rate falling to 5.1 per cent in May. There are now fewer unemployed persons in Australia than there were prior to the pandemic. We have seen jobs growth of 115,000 people for the month well above expectations, demonstrating that across Australia the economic recovery is going strongly and creating opportunities for Australians. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline some of the key job-creating measures that underpin the government's economic recovery plan? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, in the last budget, we, we announced our plan to get more people back into work. Budget projections to show 250,000 further jobs to be created, and that plan is working. It's working strongly. It's underpinned by policies that drive investment by the private sector across the Australian economy. Our full expensing measures, all about encouraging Australian businesses to invest in their competitiveness, their productivity and creating jobs for Australians across those sectors, and it's paying dividends. We've equally, of course, put money back in the pockets of hard-working Australians and their families by bringing forward income tax cuts, by providing the financial support for families to be empowered, to make their own decisions and to get and keep more from their hard work. And on this side of the chamber, we are resolutely committed to lower taxes as a continued driving vehicle for economic growth, for business investment and to support Australian families, and it's a stark contrast Order. to the uncertainty Senator on taxes Birmingham. of those officers. Time for the answers expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Minister, can you outline how the government's commitment to reducing taxes is creating more jobs and is strengthening Australia's economy? Senator Birmingham. 
Mr. President, we're providing 10 million low and middle income earners with additional taxation relief to help with the economic recovery, to help create the support across the Australian economy to keep this jobs growth going. And Mr. President, the jobs growth we're seeing and the unemployment rates that have been achieved, it's little wonder there's a fair bit of silence from those opposite, because of course we can all recall the mayhem and catastrophe, the doomsday predictions that were coming from those opposite. The doomsday predictions of those who said that, of course, millions more would find themselves on unemployment, that millions more would be in difficulty. Those opposite, Mr President, had no faith in Australia, Australian businesses, Australians or the economic plans that have been proven to work. Economic plans Order. that have been proven to work, Order. Senator Wong. I know it breaks your heart Order. to see record numbers of Australians in jobs, but we are proud to have record numbers of Australians in jobs Order. and have Senator the Australian Birmingham, economy coming the back so strongly. Has expired. Order. 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 Senator Sheldon is on his feet. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, my, question, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. In recent days, the Morrison government has announced significant changes to the Working Holiday Maker Scheme and arrangements for foreign workers. The United Kingdom's Department of International Trade has published a glossy document boasting that, and I quote, Aussie firms will no longer have to prioritise hiring Australians nationals first. Why is the Morrison government taking jobs away from Australians and giving them to UK citizens? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for his question. Well, um, given the information that's just been provided to the chamber by Senator Birmingham, I think we should all be delighting in the fact yeah. that we're seeing more Australians back in work uh, than, than the before the pandemic. And you know, we should all be celebrating the fact that we have got an unemployment rate of 5.1% today. I mean, who would have thought when we went into the pandemic that the economic recovery in this country was going to be so strong as to see 5.1% uh, unemployment in Australia? And in the home state of Senator Cash, who's sitting next to me, yes. down to 4.4 per cent, getting very, very close to full employment. But making sure, making sure that we provide a balance bin and ensuring that Australians who wish to get into the workforce are able to take that opportunity is a very, very important platform of the Morrison McCormack government's uh, economic policy. We want to see every single Australian who is able to work in work. And that's why we have put in place so many programs, particularly in recent times as we come out of the COVID pandemic, through the, uh, the job maker programs, making sure that we've got skilling and retraining programs to make sure that Australians who find themselves without work have a pathway back into the workforce. But we also hear on the other side of the equation that we are finding businesses that are struggling to be able to get employees, and we need to make sure that we provide them with a pool yeah. of resources so that they can get yep. workers. That in no way denies, in no way denies that our absolute fundamental policy position of this government is to make sure that Australians order. who are unemployed. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. The, the question was, is relevant, and the question was quite specific from Senator Sheldon. Uh, the British government has said that Aussie firms will no longer have to prioritise uh, hiring Australian nationals first. The minister hasn't addressed the question, Senator why is Keneally, the government giving away Senator, Australian jobs? Senator Keneally, the, the latter part of your point of order there means while the minister is talking about the matter she is, it is a quite right, wide-ranging part of the question at the end that Senator Sheldon asked. So I think that while the minister is talking about is Senator Wong. Clarify, Mr. President, which is the wide ranging bit? Why is the. I'm, I'm trying, Morrison government to... taking jobs away from Australians okay. and giving them to UK citizens. Okay. It is well, clearly about well, one the, issue. Well, if the minister's talking about prioritising jobs for Australians, I don't wow. think. I, the, the, this is not a time for a broad. Um, can I finish? I, I'm happy to. Please, just, I'll just finish my explanation and people can take issue with it. I view that question as giving the minister some latitude to answer and to challenge it and to explain why they are doing the opposite. Um, be, as long as it's not a general commentary on the unemployment or employment market, if the minister's talking about why they disagree with that question or talking about prioritising in government policy, I think, 
I think that's relevant. Do, Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. President. The Australian government will always prioritise jobs for Australians. We will always prioritise jobs for Australians. We want to make sure that every Australian who has wishes to have a job Order. is able to. Se Senator Keneally. I seek leave to table the ten key benefits of the UK. Australia Free Trade Agreement, where it clearly says Aussie firms will no longer okay, have to prioritise hiring I, I, Australians I have allowed, first. I have allowed. Well, I have. If I'm, um, I can only deal with questions in the. Sorry, Senator Birmingham, you're on your feet. Well, Mr. President, I was just going to respond. Senator Keneally well knows protocols and etiquettes in relation to the tabling documents in this place. If she wishes to follow those protocols, then of course the government will look at it in accordance with those protocols rather than seeking you have sought leave, you haven't shared the document with the, with the government to my knowledge. It's order. You're waving a document around the order. government has not seen. You know the protocols. If we were doing the same, you would deny leave. The clerk has um, advised me that one can't interrupt a speaker to seek leave to table. Um, I was not aware of that particular procedure. Senator Wong, to, the, to your point, I could, I can only deal with. Oh, please do. Oh, sorry, I thought I was dealing with it. Well, I, I hadn't actually stood, stood to make a point sorry. again. Uh, my point is, if you if you read it that broadly, Mr. President, with all due respect, the minister to do what, precisely what she is doing, which is to engage in parenthood statements. We all will prioritise Australian jobs. It is unsurprising that you are then going to get a response to the opposition seeking to table documents. Uh, uh, the direct relevance means dealing with the issue at hand. Just because something says jobs doesn't mean a minister can stand up and answer a question by saying we all love jobs. Okay. Can I? Um, I order, order. On the, we're wasting. I, I, I'm happy to rule. I've taken submissions. Now, on the point of order, I can. On the on the point of order, can I can I answer, Senators McKenzie? I'm not complaining about the opposition objecting to the nature of a question, Senator Wong. Um, I've allowed the opposition to restate and to make its uh, emphasise the part of the question and to take points of order. I was just pointing out to Senator Keneally that I was corrected by the clerk. I wasn't aware that you couldn't interrupt to seek leave. That was something I learnt. When it comes to the point of order, I can only deal with questions the way they are asked. I submit, Senator Wong, that you are asking me to go to the content of a minister's answer and how they might answer a question rather than what they are directly relevant. When a question is, why is the government, if I read it correctly, taking away jobs from Australians in favour of someone else, the minister is entitled to say otherwise. And as long as it's not a general commentary on unemployment or employment, I think when the minister was talking about that bit, when, you raise, when the point of order was raised, that constitutes direct relevance. There's an opportunity to debate the content and what of answers after question time and whether or not the chamber thinks the content of those answers is sufficient or satisfactory. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And to be directly relevant to Senator so Sheldon's question, the Australian government will always prioritise Australian jobs. Order. Um, uh, your point of order, you are seeking leave? Mr. President, I seek leave to table the document from Number the United two, Kingdom one. government that I have just cited Number here in the two. chamber that Aussie firms will no longer have to okay. prioritise hiring Se Aussie Senator nationals Keneally, first. Um, you, is, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, so, Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Good, thank you. Uh, well, yesterday, when announcing the new agricultural visa, Minister Lily, Lily Proud stated it would both, and I quote, "Little Proud, there you go." Order. Mirror the. This is what he said. I'll mirror the existing seasonal worker program, and it is really an extension of the working holiday scheme. Given these are entirely different standards and requirements between these programs, which is it? 
Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, both of the programs to which Senator Sheldon refers are very, very important programs to support Australia's agricultural uh, sector. And, um, and in, in announcing yesterday um, the agreement that we're putting in place with our, our Asian friends um, to make sure that we are able to support Australian farmers who are often looking for labour. Uh, and unable to fill their labour short shortages in Australia, uh, I think it is, uh, it is an exceptional uh, initiative for us to be able to support our region, support people in our region, but at the same time support our farmers who are crying out for labour at Senator the moment. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. The point of order is direct relevance. The question goes directly to whether or not this new agricultural visa will mirror the seasonal workers program or extend the working holiday scheme. They are different schemes with different conditions. So we have not asked about those existing schemes. We've asked the new, whether the new scheme, which, of the, which, of the, which architecture will it follow? So I would ask you to remind the minister that she is not being asked to give us an explanation on why the SWP or the working holiday visa are such great things. She's being asked to explain the new agricultural visa. And on that point, if, it, uh, if I'm being asked to order the minister to go to explain the differences, um, I think that is going to the content of an answer. However, to be directly relevant, let me finish, please, Senator Wong. To be directly relevant, because it was a tightly worded question, the minister must speak about the new scheme. But I can't direct the minister to answer about the content or the type of answer, which is when you're asking about differences. The minister can be directly relevant. Well, Senator Wong, I'm listening very carefully. I will admit this is not a, an area of policy that I am as aware of detail as others in the chamber, but I'm listening very carefully. I've allowed you to restate the question, and I have made, I have made, you, I've made my ruling. Senator Rustin, you have 23 seconds remaining. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Well, my understanding is that the new scheme will work alongside both the seasonal workers program and the working holiday makers, and that the details around the exact and specific details of the new scheme are currently being worked out. Uh, so I'm happy to come back to this chamber with more information Order. around the exact details Order. around the working of Order, the new program. Senator Rustin, not the order on my left. Left. I, I, order. Senator Sheldon, if I could have a moment, please. I know it's uh, senators on my left. We're wasting question time, which is traditionally a period for the non-government parties. I would not have been able to rule on a subsequent point of order then because I could not hear Senator Rustin. So there is way too much noise in the chamber. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that in recent days the Morrison government has undermined Australian workers, undermined the Pacific step up and worsened the risk of worker exploitation in Australia? Senator Rustin. No, we have not. No, here, here. Um, Senator Sheldon, Order we absolutely have not. What we have sought to do is to make sure that we support Australians through a number of initiatives yeah, yeah. who wish to get into work. But at the same time, we also recognise that there are some sectors of the Australian economy that are crying out for workers at the moment and are unable to fill those particular positions within Australia. So what this government has sought to do is have a suite of measures that support everybody in the Australian economy, whether it be Australians who find themselves out of work and making sure that we provide them with Order. the skills and the retraining so that Senator they can get Watt. back into the workforce, but at the same time support, our farmers, and support McKenzie. our farmers who are crying out for labour. So what we will do is we will continue Order. to make sure that we address all of the issues that our economy faces going forward and not just one of them, by making sure we support our businesses Order. to make sure they've got employees and in support our Australians into Order. jobs. Senator, <coughs> Senator Watt, Senator Keneally, Senator Rennick. Senator Watt, count. S Senator Rennick, Senator M Watt, remember my rule about counting to ten after your name is called. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Rustin, uh, acting for the Resources Minister. Now, I've worked very hard to make this question very short and very straightforward. Order on my Minister, right. 
Order. Stop the clock. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Minister. Minister, do you accept the science that burning fossil fuels is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and that rising greenhouse gas emissions are linked to the warming of the world's oceans? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Sen uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Wish Wilson for his question. Um, if you are asking me whether I am a climate denier, Senator Wish Wilson, no, I'm not. Uh, so, Senator Wish Wilson, though, um, one thing that, that this government has always been absolutely clear about Senator and Watt. remains absolutely committed to is to make sure that we support Australians with reliable, affordable, dispatchable power, but at the same time. Order. Senator Wish Wilson <coughs> on a point of order. Just want to stress how hard I work, President, to make uh, this very, very simple question. Um, the point of order is Directly. saying you're not a climate denier is not answering the question. It was really a yes or no question. Um, President, I asked the minister to be relevant. Order. Um, just as you were trying to write a tight question, Senator Wish Wilson, I was trying to hear the minister, but I couldn't, despite my numerous calls to order across the chamber. However, um, while I couldn't hear part of the minister's answer while I was calling the chamber to order, I, I can't accept your submission that I can direct the minister how to answer a question. I will listen carefully. You've reminded the minister of the question. I do so again. She has 91 seconds remaining. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I am more than happy to uh, to give you the government's policy as it, as it relates to supporting Australians, as supporting Australian industry, and making sure that we also are in a position where we protect Australia's environment and and also take our responsibility for the protection of the world environment as well. Uh, if you wish to um, to to ask things in relation to oceans, maybe you should be considering asking your question uh, to the minister for the environment. But what I will say about Australia's <laughs> energy policy is that we are at absolutely committed to meet every single obligation we have, an obligation to the Australian public, reliable, affordable and dispatchable power, an obligation internationally to the, the targets order. that we— Senator Rustin. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. On a point of order, President, with only 49 seconds to go, could I just ask the minister to answer my question? Um, I, I do think that was a fair point of order on direct relevance, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, Senator Rustin, the question related to the various concepts rather than government policies. So I take the opportunity to remind you you can answer in a personal capacity or a government capacity because it did say, do you accept? Um, so to that extent, um, it wasn't a broad question on government policy. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I, I think I did answer um, Senator Wish Wilson's question in my first response uh, immediately after him asking the question, uh, and I'll stand by that. Uh, I am not a climate denier. Uh, however, um, I also am a very strong believer in all of the policies that are put in place by the government of which I am a member to make sure that we meet our obligations and support we support a future in this country and this world uh, that makes sure that our environment is protected for our children and for their children, Senator Wish Wilson. But we as a government are not going to undertake that, those policies at the detriment to Australia, to Australians, to the Australian economy. But we will make sure in the process of going forward into a, to a future uh, that I think every Australian wants. We will Order, do. Senator Rustin. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Chair. I'll take the fact you're not a climate denier as a, as a yes to that question. Um, do you also accept that scientists are linking the warming of our oceans to catastrophic changes and impacts we are seeing in our marine habitats, such as three mass coral bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef in the last five years, the loss of Tasmania's giant kelp forests, the vanishing of seagrass beds around the country and the loss of thousands of kilometres of mangrove habitat? are linked to so climate order, change. Senator, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Once again, thank you very much, Senator Wish Wilson, for your question. Um, I can only answer the question as it relates to a per, uh, requesting me to provide you with my answer, uh, you know, with my opinion, which I'm quite happy to say that uh, I am not a climate denier and I believe that it is extraordinarily important that we make sure that we look after our environment. But if you want to ask specific questions in relation to the environment and many of the, the, the things that were in the substance of your question, order. Senator Wish Wilson, related to very, very very specific aspects 
of environmental policy, and I do not represent the Minister for the Environment. However, I am more than happy, I am more than happy to take on notice the questions that you have asked in relation to the environment and refer them to the Environment Minister to provide you with an answer to your question. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, I remind you that you're the Minister for Burning Fossil Fuels, which impact the environment. Can you then explain to coastal communities, ocean lovers, tourism operators, surfers, divers, fishers right around the nation why you are responsible for releasing 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean acreage to oil and gas companies to explore for the exact same fossil fuels that are responsible for killing our oceans? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I'll just point out, Senator Wish Wilson, I am the minister in the Senate who represents the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Just to be absolutely correct about the title uh, of the of the particular ministry of which you're directing this question. Um, and and as of yesterday, as you, yesterday I answered the question in relation um, to um, the the opening up of a particular area of ocean between Victoria and Tasmania. Um, but once again. Once again, Order. the uh, independent assessment of the environmental uh, impact of anything that occurs Senator, is undertaken Senator by Wish an independent organisation, not SEMA, which I'm sure you, Senator Wish Senator Wilson, Wish will be very well aware of the, the, uh, the obligations under the NOPSEMA, of NOPSEMA under the Act about making sure that they do not enable or do not allow exploration to be undertaken in a way that is Senator detrimental Wish to Wilson. the environment in which it is being undertaken. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the attorney and relates to whistleblowers. The Commonwealth, uh, the, the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution's po prosecution policy provides a two-stage test that must be satisfied before a prosecution is commenced. There must be sufficient evidence to prosecute the case and it must be evident from the facts of the case and all of the surrounding circumstances that the prosecution would be in the public interest. When asked about the impact of the prosecution of Bernard Collieri and Witness K on the relationship between Australia and East Timor uh, at estimates, the acting CDPP said that uh, that would be a step beyond the scope of the, ma the matters that we have or we normally consider. So it's clear that hasn't been considered properly. Uh, Attorney, can you please provide this chamber with an explanation as to why it is in the public interest to, pub uh, to uh, prosecute Bernard Collieri and, and Witness K for calling out uh, unlawful activity? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question. And Mr. President, uh, this matter is currently before the court. In fact, it is in the court today, so I will be very cautious in the comments that I make to Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Patrick, you did ask questions uh, at Senate Estimates and you were provided with the responses that you have referred to. Uh, what I can now say in relation to your question is this. The Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions considered the brief of evidence and made an independent decision that a prosecution was the appropriate course of action in relation to this case. As you have stated, this was done in accordance with a prosecution policy of the Commonwealth that requires the CDPP be satisfied that the prosecution would be in the public interest. Mr Kaliri was charged with an offence of conspiracy to communicate Australian secret intelligence service information contrary to section 11.5 of the Criminal Code Act 1995 and section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001, and with further offences of communicating Australian secret intelligence service information, contrary to section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. You would also be aware, Witness K, has been charged with an offence con of conspiracy to communicate Australian secret intelligence service information, contrary to section 11.5 of the Criminal Code Act 1995 and section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. As I said, this is an independent decision that the CDPP made 
in terms Order. of Senator Cash. Time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I understand witness K has actually pleaded guilty in the uh, ACT Magistrates Court to conspiring to reveal classified information. Clearly, the government has worn uh, witness K uh, down. Uh, over the years, including the removal of his passport in 2013, so he could not leave this country. He, uh, he of course, took that matter to, to the AAT. What's the current status of his passport? Will he, be, will he have his passport returned to him? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. In the first instance, Senator Patrick, you have provided a commentary in relation to this matter. That is merely your commentary. The government does not agree with what you have stated. In relation to the issue of the passport, that is a matter, Mr President, uh, more appropriately dealt with by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And my understanding is they would not normally comment on the status of a person or Australian's passport. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. So we've got uh, the government prosecuting uh, whistleblower David McBride after he revealed uh, uh, war crimes in Afghanistan, which of course have been the subject of the Brereton uh, report. There's no question what he claimed uh, did occur. We also know uh, of uh, Richard Boyle, who uh, called out the uh, uh, improper use of garnishee notices. He blew the whistle. He's being prosecuted. What's it, what, what is the public interest in prosecuting these whistleblowers? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And as I've already stated uh, in my answer to Senator Patrick's first question, these matters are all currently before the court. What I will say, though, in relation to the two further matters uh, that Senator Patrick has raised is that the prosecutions, as you are aware, Senator Patrick, you asked questions at estimates, uh, have been brought because the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions made an independent decision that the prosecutions are in accordance with the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, and my fellow Senator from WA, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the state of the labour market following today's ABS labour force figures and how the Morrison government's 21 budget is securing Australia's economic recovery? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman for the question. And, uh, Mr. President, the labour force figures uh, have been released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics today uh, in relation to May 2021. What we have seen today is as follows. The unemployment rate has decreased to 5.1 per cent. The participation rate, colleagues, has actually increased to 66.2 per cent. So Australians are saying, I'm out there, I'm ready, willing and able to undertake work. Employment itself is now at a record high, Mr President, in Australia. 13 million 125,100. The employment to population ratio has itself increased to 62.8 per cent. Underemployment, which we often uh, talk about in this chamber, has actually decreased to 7.4 per cent, and the monthly hours worked for May increased by 25 million hours. So, Mr. President, what we saw in the release of the labour force statistics today was employment in the month of May increased by 115,200, and that exceeded all market expectations. There are now more than 13.1 million Australians in work, and that is a record number of Australians in employment. And when you look at where we were 12 months ago, that is a good thing that we can stand here 12 months later and say we have a record number of Australians in employment. What it actually means is that the level of employment is now 130,300 above the pre-COVID level that was recorded in March 2020. And in fact, it's now 987,200, or 8.1 per cent higher than the trough in the labour market recorded in May 2020. And pleasingly, in terms of full-time job creation, the majority of jobs created in May were full-time jobs. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Amazing testament to Australian businesses and Australian workers, Minister. 
Can the minister outline how the government is continuing to support our labour market to recover from the once-in-a-century economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Brockman, you are, it is right. You are absolutely correct. It is a testament to all of the employers out there, the employers who are working with the government, looking at the government's policies, investing in the government policies and creating more employment. And as I was saying, Mr. President, in answer to uh, Senator Brockman's first question, in the month of May, what we saw is that 97,500 of those jobs that were created were full-time jobs. That is a good thing, and it is all due to the employers out there taking on people, giving them those full-time jobs. In fact, in Australia now, we have full-time employment at a record high, 8 million. 965,200 Australians. And that is why, as a government, and certainly in the budget uh, that we recently brought down, we continue to put in place those policies that businesses in Australia can lever off to prosper, grow, and as today we've seen with the labour market figures for, for May, create more Order. jobs Senator for Australia. Cash. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As the COVID 19 pandemic continues to have a devastating impact around the world, can the minister explain why Australians can continue to have confidence in the resilience of our labour market and our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, again, when you look at where we were 12 months ago and then you look at where we are today, Treasury was modelling at the height of COVID-19 that unemployment could potentially go to 15 per cent. Two million Australians could have been out of work. In May 2021, what we are now seeing is a drop in the unemployment rate to 5.1 per cent. We're seeing an increase in the participation rate. We're seeing an increase in the number of full-time jobs that have been created. And again, we're seeing employers working with the government, utilising the government's policies that we've put in place to ensure that they are prospering, growing and creating more jobs for Australians. But, Mr President, we always acknowledge that people are still doing it tough out there. There are businesses out there that are still doing it tough. And that is why we continue to put in place those policies, for example, the instant asset write-off. For those businesses who do have that ability to invest, we are saying to them, invest in your business, grow your business and create more jobs for Australians. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Minister, yesterday the Acting Premier of Victoria, James Molino, said, and I quote, Victorians have turned out in their thousands to get vaccinated, but we just can't maintain this rate without certainty about supply from the Commonwealth. Why has the Morrison government failed to give certainty of supply and forced the Victorian government to stop taking bookings for the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr President, thank uh, Senator Ciccone for the question. Mr. President, uh, the Australian government has in fact provided additional resources and vaccines to Victoria to assist them through their current circumstance, Mr President. Um, and so we've worked very closely with the Victorian government. We, we've, we've supported them in, in vaccine supply, Mr President. Yeah, and, and so, Mr President, so th there are a significant number of additional vaccines that have been supplied to Victoria to assist them with the rollout. So I don't, I don't accept the premise of the question that's been put by Senator Ciccone, uh, that we are trying to starve Victorians of vaccine supply. In fact, we've worked very cooperatively to provide additional capacity and additional vaccines in the tens of thousands to Victorians so that they have additional supply to support Victorians who are looking for a vaccine. And Mr. President, the announcement today Order. is also obviously going to create some, uh, some further challenges Order. with the changes in the advice that were received with respect to the, to, to the uh, Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines. Mr. President, we will follow that advice and we will continue to work with the states towards supporting them in, in the role. Senator, Senator Colbeck. Senator Ciccone. Uh, look, thank you, Mr. President. On relevance, um, and I don't want to repeat part of the question, but the quote that I had asked the minister was, very, was directly from the acting premier about the, the lack of certainty about the supply from the Commonwealth. That was the acting premier's direct quote. Thank and asking to, to address that part of the I question. Think you've emphasised part of the question. I think, with respect, the minister was talking about uh, the supply of vaccines to the state of Victoria, so I think he is directly relevant. Um, Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, we have worked very closely with Victoria to support them in, with, with supplies, Mr. President. Uh, and, Mr. President, we have provided uh, additional vaccines to the tune of 150,930 over four weeks to vaccine to, to Victoria for Pfizer vaccines. Mr. President, we've provided them 170,000 doses over six weeks of AstraZeneca. Uh, and we've provided an additional 330,000 AstraZeneca into our primary care clinics into Victoria so that they can be assisted with the current issues that they're dealing with, Mr. President. Uh, we will continue to work closely with the Victorian government and all of the other states uh, to ensure that they have the maximum available supplies to support people to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that at National Cabinet the Commonwealth committed to ensuring a supply of the second dose? And why has the government failed to meet this commitment? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Ciccone, for the question. Uh, the, the Commonwealth government has given supply indications for vaccines to each state out over a considerable period of time, Mr President. We continue to work with the states as those vaccine supplies are confirmed from our suppliers. And we will continue to do that, Mr President. So we have given supply indications to each of the states. Uh, we have uh, met those supply indications and we continue to work with the states in circumstances as we are working with Victoria right now to ensure that they have the maximum available supply that we can, we can provide to them. Uh, to support their vaccine rollout, Mr. President, additional 150,000 Pfizer vaccines to Victoria over four weeks, Mr. President. 170,000 additional extras AstraZeneca to Victorian state government over six weeks, and over 330,000 additional doses, Mr. President, to our primary care providers. Senator Tony, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How many aged care workers have been turned away from Victorian vaccination centres as a result of the Morrison government's failure to provide certainty of supply, as it promised at National Cabinet? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, my advice from the Victorian government, from Order. three sources, Mr. President, is that uh, uh, aged care workers remain a priority category uh, for vaccination in Victoria. That advice has been provided to me by three sources within the Victorian government, so I don't accept that uh, the, that uh, the workers are not being uh, not, I don't have vaccine available to them, Mr. President, because I've had it confirmed from three sources within the Victorian government that uh, they remain they re remain a priority, uh, and there still are bookings available for aged care workers if they want to go and get a vaccine. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Seselja. Given the importance of diesel to Territorians, particularly those in remote locations who rely on diesel to run power generations and critical machinery, can the Minister outline to the Senate the importance of diesel to our economy and what action the Liberal and National Governments is taking to ensure we have an affordable and secure supply of diesel. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator McMahon for the question. The Liberal National Government is taking strong action to further boost Australia's long-term fuel security, and we're doing it by locking in the future of our refining sector. Now, our economy relies heavily on energy from liquid fuels, and this will continue to grow. Diesel is our most important transport fuel, and Australians use more diesel than electricity. It's also the critical fuel source during an emergency, powering the trucks that move our food, our pharmaceuticals and our emergency Order. services vehicles. That's why we're increasing Senator the amount of diesel Ayers. we keep on shore. Holding more diesel in Australia will increase our resilience to supply disruptions, protecting consumers and the economy from fuel shortages. We're investing $200 million through a competitive grants program to build new diesel storage. But, Mr President, this is just part of our plan to ensure that Australians have access to the affordable, reliable and secure supply of fuel they rely on. We're ensuring we have access to the fuel Order we need to left. keep Australia moving. 
Our comprehensive fuel security package will also lock in around 4,000 jobs, and through both, both new construction jobs and protecting those at refineries. Now, the Greens may not like it, Labor may not like it, but this will be done through a variable production payment, meaning the refineries will only be paid when they Order. need it, not when they're making profits. And our package will also enhance Australia's national security. Keep fuel prices for consumers among the lowest in the OECD. Now, the events of 2020 have reminded us that we can't be complacent. We're taking the action now to shield us from potential shocks in the future and enhance our national security. Our plan will help ensure Australia has the appropriate sovereign capability it needs for any event. We're protecting families and businesses from higher prices and supporting thousands of jobs across the economy as we Order. recover from COVID-19. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Order on my left. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the government's fuel security package will help secure the diesel that we rely on? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, yes, I can, and thank, I thank the senator for the question. The Liberal National Government's fuel security package will help secure Australia's fuel stocks through a minimum stockholding obligation that will protect our ability to produce vital fuels like diesel during an emergency. Now, in a worst-case scenario, even if oil imports uh, are disrupted, our refineries will have the ability to provide the fuel needed to run our critical services. The minimum stockholding obligation will also safeguard levels of petrol Order. and jet fuel and see a 40 per cent increase in our diesel stocks from 2024 to be kept in Australia. Now, we know that this is the least distortionary way of working with industry to improve supply chain resilience and protect consumers. Delivering secure liquid fuels such as diesel goes hand in hand with ensuring Australian households and businesses have access to cheap and reliable power. All of these measures are critical to recovering from the pandemic, protecting jobs, growing our economy and keeping all Australians safe, including those in the top end. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how the government is working to build our sovereign fuel re refining and storage capacity? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, yes, I can. And we have. This is about sovereignty. And we have delivered on our promise and locked in Australia's Order. refining capacity Across and its 1,250 employees. Now, Senator the Greens Thorpe. may not like it, uh, but with the Ampol Order. refinery in Brisbane and the Viva Energy refinery in Geelong both remaining in operation until at least mid-2027, and I note it's been warmly welcomed by the AWU. Now, supporting our refineries will ensure we have the sovereign capability needed to prepare for any event protect families and businesses from higher prices at the Bowser and keep Australians moving as we recover. Now, This is a key part of our plan to, to secure Australia's recovery from the pandemic Order. and prepare against any future crises. This builds on the action we've already Senator taken is. to boost our fuel security, taking advantage of record low global oil prices to purchase Australia's first government-owned crude oil stocks for domestic security. We're taking action to ensure we have the fuel Order. we Senator need Selger, to keep Australia the moving and to protect expired. our— Senator Kitching. President, my question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. In defending her heartless failure to pick up the phone and personally apologise to the family of Liam Danher, after 78 days in the portfolio, the minister asserted that, and I quote, if my chief of staff does something on my behalf, then I consider that is the case. Why won't the minister just pick up the phone and apologise to Liam's family? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank the senator for that question. And can I just say, first and foremost, in all of these circumstances, and, there, and tragically there are more than one case, my first and foremost uh, consideration is the, the, is the respects and the wishes of the family. As I have previously advised this chamber, uh, my office has contacted uh, Mr Danher's family, his father in fact, and offered a call or a meeting with me. It was agreed at this meeting it would best take place once more information is available and when that has occurred. The NDIA Chief Legal Counsel is reviewing um, Liam Danher's case and will provide a report on the detail and any learnings that the NDIA can take from this case. 
and the outcomes of that uh, will be communicated to the family prior to any public uh, comment on this case. Order. Senator Reynolds, as, on as, a point of order, I have Senator, Kitch have Senator said, Reynolds. I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. Mr. President, it was the question was very clear. Why hasn't the minister picked up the phone and apologised to Liam's family? Um, and I, I, I think, with respect, I've allowed you to remind the minister of the answer. The minister is entitled to answer the question in the terms that she sees fit. Um, and she is talking about this particularly unfortunate event, and in that sense, she is directly relevant, uh, answering the question as she deems appropriate. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I, I did answer the question uh, first up, and I'll just say it again, is first and foremost. I believe it's important for me to respect the wishes of the individual families and including Liam Danher's family. And that is exactly what I'm doing in relation to this case and also to, to other cases that have come, come to my attention. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. What other actions has the minister asserted were her, were her own when in fact they were the actions of her chief of staff? And if you can't answer it all now, you can take it on notice and come back to, to the chamber. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank uh, the senator for that question, and uh, as you know, she's already put those questions on notice to me. So, of course, I will answer those uh, in in the normal course of events. Uh, as as I said yesterday, and as I've repeated again today, first and foremost, it is important for me to respect the wishes of individual family members, and that is what I Order. always do. I have directly talked to some family members where they have wished to do so and when and how they wish to do so. And Senator again, Kitching, my chief of on staff a, Senator Kitching, uh, acted um, on, on a, my behalf. Uh, Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. I did give the minister an option that if she couldn't remember everything that she had said that she did, but in fact it was her chief of staff, she could come back and re report to the chamber. But if she can give me some of that now, that would be helpful. Um, with respect, I think the minister did say, oh, the minister's concluded, but did refer to questions on notice being answered as well. Senator Kitching. It's a very bad memory. Senator Mr. Kitching, a final um, supplementary question. Given the actions of her staff are in fact her own, can the minister confirm that rather than becoming aware of Ms Higgins' allegation of rape progressively over days, as she has claimed, in fact, she became aware at the same time her chief of staff became aware, that is, three days after the alleged rape, on the 26th of March, 2019. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, look, thank you very much. Um, I would argue that that is not in any way a supplementary question uh, in relation to the, the Danhurst case. But as I have said uh, in many forums, in this chamber and also at estimates, I'm currently assisting the AFP with their inquiries into these matters, and they are subject of a statement that I've provided the AFP, and it would be entirely inappropriate for me to comment further. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the rollout of the cashless debit card? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. And can I also acknowledge the fantastic work that you've been doing, Senator O'Sullivan, uh, to help— Please resume, sir. I can't hear— Senator Rustin, who is as close to me as any other senator in the chamber physically, only a seat away. Can I please hear Senator Rustin's answer? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the work that he's doing to make sure people on the cash that's kept card move along the pathway to employment. It is really important because, in your own words, Senator O'Sullivan, the government does not believe that the cashless debit card is a destination. It is a tool to help people take control of their own lives, become job ready and get into work. Because having a meaningful job uh, is, uh, is what we believe uh, can be a destination for all working age Australians. Since the 17th of March, people on income management uh, using the Basics card in the Northern Territory and Cape York have been able to make the switch to the CDC. And I'm pleased to update the Senate that the transition in the Cape York has now been completed, with all 88 people using the Basics card now across onto the cashless debit card. 
And, uh, the Families Responsibility Commission does a fantastic job in Cape York to help their people stabilise their lives. And I was fortunate enough to see some of the Commission hearings uh, while I was there, where a lady in the community actually chose to go onto the cashless debit card uh, to have some of her social security payment uh, quarantined so she could pay for the maintenance of her, her home. In fact, she's one of 47 people in the Cape who volunteered to go on the card. That's people who were not required to be on it. They have voluntarily done so. In the Northern Territory to date, we've seen 108 people make the switch from the basics card to the cashless debit card. And while I was in Darwin, I was fortunate enough to sit with somebody who went through the process uh, at the Casuarina Service Centre. And he told me Order. that he Senator wanted to Watt. make the switch because the CDC is a debit visa card which would allow him to pay his bills online, have more independence over uh, his, uh, his settings on his budget, and we will continue to work uh, to ensure people in the Northern Territory are armed with factual information about the cashless debit card. Order. Senator Brockman, a supplement oh, sorry, Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister please explain how the cashless debit card is providing income management participants with more choice and freedom? I'll call the minister to answer when I'll be able to hear her. Is there any ability to restrain oneself on the left of the chamber at the moment? Senator Rennick, please, as well. Senator Watt, Senator Ayres, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. The cashless debit card is a debit visa card, and it works just the same as any other key card in your purse or your wallet. The only difference is you cannot buy alcohol, most gambling products or get cash. It can be used in over a million shops across Australia. It can be used online in comparison to the just 17,000 outlets which accept the basics card. Order. Senators uh, Watt and Rennick. The, base, the cashless debit card, unlike the basics uh, card, can be used at pubs, clubs, restaurants and cafes to buy meals and non-alcoholic drinks. Senator it can also Green. be used to buy lotto tickets and scratchies. The government wants participants Senator to have Watt. choice and freedom, and we have no issue at all with people who want to buy beer or have a punt from time to time. This program is about helping people to stabilise their lives, become job ready, and hopefully, hopefully, get back into the workforce. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, you mentioned you've been out on the ground. Can you please advise what feedback that you've received when you've been in these communities about the cashless debit card? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, overwhelmingly, we heard that people were really excited about the fact that they can use their cashless debit card when they travel, whether it be Cairns to Sydney to Adelaide or Perth or anywhere else. But the other issue they raised, Senator O'Sullivan, was the number of uh, times it was around the misinformation that is out there. The opposition are running an absolutely shameful scare campaign aimed at aged pensioners. Order. They are lying Order. to them. Let me Order. be absolutely crystal clear. The government has Order. no plan to force age pensioners onto the cashless debit card, and we will Order. never have such a plan. The cashless debit card Order is for working age there payments to help to people stabilise their lives, become job ready and get back into the workforce. Those opposite must cease Order. telling Australians lies. They must tell Order. the truth, which is something that they are not doing at the Order. moment. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, much as it's nice to watch uh, Senator Rustin call out the lies of those opposite, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Sorry? Um, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that word because it did refer to specific people. I, 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 I withdraw. Thank you, Senator yeah. Birmingham. So the uh, question is, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McCarthy. Um, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the question asked by Senator Wong. Just three days ago, on June 14, the Minister for Health told Australians 
In terms of the vaccines that are available at this point, the Commonwealth has made AstraZeneca available on the medical advice for those that are over 50. He also said regarding the vaccine rollout, supply dictates the rollout, and we've provided advice on all of the confirmed supply that we have. So we obviously have very clear line of sight with regards to AstraZeneca. The states and territories have ample volumes of AstraZeneca. End of quote. Now, just a few minutes ago in question time, we had the minister representing the health minister tell us every Australian who wants a vaccine will have access to one by the end of the year. But what they can't tell us, Madam Deputy President, is how they are going to do this. Thoughts and prayers isn't going to cut it. Wishful thinking certainly won't deliver an adequate supply of the Pfizer vaccine, especially now we have changed health advice, meaning more Australians will be wanting the Pfizer vaccine. Now, remember, this was the health minister that told Australians last month that for anyone hesitant to get the AstraZeneca shot, there would be enough Pfizer for everyone by the end of the year. He then had to come out and correct this statement, telling us that we, in fact, shouldn't be waiting for Pfizer stocks to increase. Is your head spinning? Mine certainly is. But isn't it any wonder Australians have lost trust in what this government is telling them about the vaccine rollout? Trust in the public health system is absolutely crucial to support vaccine uptake, and we cannot afford for this to be damaged by the bungling of the Morrison government. Improving access to COVID-19 vaccines is crucial to increase uptake. It's crucial the government is honest with us about how long those under 60 may now have to wait to access the Pfizer vaccine. And I know this is a big ask of the Morrison government to stop the spin machine and just tell us simply and clearly when all Australians under 60 can get their Pfizer shot. They also need to tell us exactly when they were first advised by ATAGI that they should be considering raising the age for the AstraZeneca vaccine. This inability to be clear and straight with us is impacting individuals and communities. There's already vaccine hesitancy among some of our most vulnerable populations. Just last week, a Central Australian Aboriginal uh, Medical Centre was avoiding Pfizer vaccine waste by offering vaccines to non-Aboriginal people over the age of 50. Dr John Boffer, the Chief Medical Officer of the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, conceded there had been vaccine hesitancy among the Aboriginal population. In order not to waste a single dose, Congress put friends and family of staff on a waiting list to, to use up any of the leftovers. I'm very pleased there was take up here, but I'm also concerned that there was so much vaccine left over. And this is for Pfizer. We can't get figures on what percentage of the population in remote communities have taken up the vaccine offer. We just can't get them. I've tried. Australian Medical Association Northern Territory President Dr Robert Parker has said concerns about the AstraZeneca vaccine had already sparked fears and hesitancy. That was before today's announcement about the medical advice to raise the age. Now, I've been out there talking to families, talking to Territorians, urging them to get the jab. I've also been urging the Morrison government to do its job and invest in a nationwide public awareness campaign, including translation into First Nations languages. The mess messaging by the federal government to the community, let alone the First Nations and uh, those with second languages who are not First Nations, obviously multicultural communities, has really been lacking in this whole process. First Nations media did an amazing job at the start of this pandemic getting out messages about hygiene and movement restrictions to keep people and communities safe. Their efforts have been recognised internationally and held up as best practice, but they have not been funded to do the same thing when it comes to the vaccine rollout. There have been restrictions on the ability of First Nations media and other organisations to craft their own messages in language and at the community level to encourage vaccine take-up. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Davey. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Senator McCarthy for raising this very important issue and highlighting the vaccination rollout across the country. Um, I acknowledge uh, Senator McCarthy's concerns about uh, the different vaccines that are available, the new health advice that we have um, relating to the AstraZeneca vaccine. But I also want to reassure the Australian people that this government is on the job. We are getting the vaccines out there, and uh, vaccinations are predominantly very safe. And we don't want to engage in this rhetoric that leads to and adds to the vaccine hesitancy. I want to thank the millions of Australians that have already put their arms out and received their vaccinations. I note that we are getting better at our vaccination rollout. Whereas in the early days of the rollout, it took 45 days to reach the first million doses. It took only 10 days to get the last million. We've got over 6 million doses out into people's arms across the country. We have more than 60 per cent of people aged over 70 are vaccinated and protected. More than 40 per cent of people aged over 50 are vaccinated and protected. And we have about one in four of the eligible po population, that is people aged over 16, who have at least one dose of the vaccination. We will see our first arrivals of the Moderna vaccination from September and October this year. And we are already getting more GPs the vaccinations they need so they can give their, uh, their patients, their clients um, the vaccination and we can really ramp up the rollout to get more and more people vaccinated throughout the country. We are expanding access to Pfizer across Australia and that's why we're using the valuable GP workforce. This expansion was planned to coincide with our highest expected arrival of Pfizer doses so far, and during July we expect another 2.8 million doses to come. Uh, we're continuing to work very closely with the states and territories uh, and, and supporting their vaccination hubs, which are hugely successful. And, uh, I note all New South Wales and Victoria are seeing record vaccinations going out the door. Our core infrastructure is now well established and well tested. Um, and I do also want to uh, come to the point raised by Senator McCarthy about um, educating the community across our multicultural community. Our government has provided 1.3 million for peak multicultural organisations to help reach culturally and linguistically diverse communities, including First Nations communities. Our ethnic media includes press, radio, social and out-of-home campaigns to ensure that people in linguistically diverse communities understand the vaccination rollout, they're aware of what their rights are. Um, and they're aware of how, uh, the importance of getting vaccinations. Um, campaign assets have been translated into 32 languages, while other materials are in over 60 languages across Australia. We are very aware that in our multicultural society it is very important that we don't limit ourselves to a homogenous uh, education and communications campaign. But our research also shows that people want the facts. And that is why when people go to um, Australia's COVID vaccination rollout website, they will be able to find out, are they eligible? Where they can go to book a vaccination? How to book a vaccination? And they can also access advice from trusted people, such as the head of the Therapeutic Goods Association, John Skerritt, and the former Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Nick Coatesworth and our chief nurse, among other experts. This campaign is working. Our record vaccination day saw over 120,000 vaccinations in one day. Um, I encourage anyone listening to go to australia.gov.au to find those facts, to check if they're eligible, to find their local clinic and to book now, put their arm out, get their vaccination and join in with the one in four 
people in Australia who've already got a vaccination dose. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, Senator Green. Government, it is clear that this vaccine rollout is bungled, botched and a bloody mess. Because what we know is that under this government, we have seen a vaccine rollout that has been delayed, played down and even, we've been told from the, the Prime Minister, isn't a race. Well, I want to join with my colleague, Senator McCarthy, in encouraging the government to deal with vaccine hesitancy and be clear that in standing in this chamber today, we are not seeking to downplay the importance of the vaccine. And anyone that tries to say that is absolutely wrong. We have always, always supported the vaccine itself. But it is absolutely fundamental that we should be able to come in here and criticise the government's vaccine rollout because they are doing a shoddy job. We have sat, Senator McCarthy and I have sat in Senate estimates and asked officials of your departments what they are doing to deal with vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, particularly in First Nations uh, communities. And the answers have been absolutely galling. I, made sure that those department officials knew that there was a problem with vaccine hesitancy in the Torres Strait and throughout the Cape. And what I got told was that it wasn't a problem, but the figures uh, show that it is. So instead of just trying to pretend like everything is okay, what we want to see from this government is taking this seriously. Taking this seriously and understanding that no amount of spin can make this any better because we've been in this pandemic for more than a year and Scott Morrison still can't get quarantine right and he still can't get vaccines right either. There's no excuses anymore when it comes to what this Prime Minister is responsible for. And yet again today we've seen the Prime Minister and the government trying to make sure that people know that this isn't their fault, that they're not responsible for the vaccine rollout. Well, Australians feel incredibly different. We found out today that AstraZeneca vaccine will only be recommended for the use in people aged 60 and over due to the concerns over rare blood clotting. And that is medical advice, and we accept that advice. But can I be very clear about this? We're now only producing a vaccine type in Australia that can only be used for people over the age of 60. So the majority of people are not, uh, not able to get the vaccines that we are producing here in Australia. If only we could have foreseen uh, the need to produce a vaccine here on shore 12 months ago. That's what other countries did. They foresaw that issue. And the government likes to talk about statistics a lot, but they definitely cherry pick the best ones. Because when we look at what's happening in other countries, what is happening in other countries, the US has uh, vaccinated 44% of its population. And Donald Trump was their, their um, uh, president. 44% of, of the population has been vaccinated. In the UK, 45% of people have been vaccinated. And their government's been described as a shop, shopping trolley smashing between aisles. What does that say about you lot and your vaccine rollout? The worldwide average is 6.2% of vaccine population. But Australia is sitting at just under 3% of the population being fully vaccinated. And while the government talks about doses, what they're not talking about is people who are fully vaccinated because they want to believe, they want to back in the Prime Minister when he says that this is not a race. The Prime Minister says that the vaccinations are not a race. We'll tell that to aged care workers still waiting to be vaccinated and the disability workers who are still waiting to receive a single dose. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race. We'll tell that to communities still facing lockdowns. They have had enough. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race, but tell that to international tourism businesses who have been told that they will have to wait until mid-2022 before international tourists return to our shores. They think that this is a race. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race, but tell that to the 36,000 Australians waiting to come home because this government refuses to take responsibility for national quarantine. Well, they think that this is a race. The Prime Minister said that this is not a race. We'll tell that 
to the Indigenous communities, the remote Indigenous communities who have not received a single dose of this vaccine but remain incredibly vulnerable to COVID-19. They think that this is a race. Vaccinating our country and making quarantine safe is a race and we are dead last. We don't even have our Thank shoes on. We Thank haven't you, even got Senator ready Green. yet. Green, your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I think thou dost protest too much, Senator Green. You stand up and you begin your speech here today by saying, oh no, Labor is not politicising this. Labor is not politicising this issue. We're not trying to make political point scoring out of this issue. And then you spend the next five minutes and you spent you know, many hours in estimates are doing exactly that, politicising this issue, trying to make what is a very complex and, and technical um, uh, undertaking um, into a political point scoring exercise. I would encourage all Australians to get out there and get a vaccine. I'm on the list to get my vaccine. Uh, it was going to be AstraZeneca. It was going to be AstraZeneca. Um, and, and now that may have changed depending on what happens over the next few months, and timing will obviously potentially uh, shift in terms of my booking. But the point is, and I don't often quote John Maynard Keynes in this place, I don't think I've ever done it before and I don't plan to do it again probably, but when the facts change, I change my mind. That's what John Maynard Keynes said. And what have we got? We've got today from ATAGI, the expert medical group, the group that Labor constantly tells us that they are seeking to do the right thing and follow the medical advice. Uh, has, has changed the recommendation on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, this is the second time the recommendation has been changed. The government has been completely upfront about that. Uh, it is the second time the age recommendation on the AstraZeneca vaccine has been changed as new information has come to hand, which is exactly appropriate. It is ex the, exactly the way that this rollout should be managed, and it is the government taking note of the change to the recommendation the updated advice on the Pfizer vaccine for adults aged under 60. Now, until today, ATAGI's advice has been the Pfizer vaccine was preferred for adults under the age of 50. This updated advice, taking that age to 60, is based on new evidence demonstrating a higher risk than originally thought of a rare blood clotting condition. Um, I'm not even going to try and say that uh, the condition's name for the 50 to 59 year old age group. Um, but those opposite also don't like the facts of the vaccine rollout. Uh, the facts that include uh, a, a total number of vaccines uh, of six, over six million, a daily increase of, of 152,000 uh, as of uh, midnight, the 15th of the 6th, 2021. In the last seven days, 738,000 doses. In the last eight days, almost 900,000 doses. In the last nine days, a million doses. And the rollout has, as we always said it would, uh, and, um, and, and as uh, we, Austra the Australian people would expect, has significantly boosted over time. So the first million doses took 45 days. The second million doses took 20 days. The third uh, a, a million doses took 17 days. The four million dose mark was hit 13 days after that. The five million dose mark nine days after that, and the six million dose mark uh, around 10 days after that. So the rollout has significantly uh, ramped up over time. But obviously, the government has taken note of the medical advice and has acted on that expert medical advice and has altered the program accordingly. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, extraordinarily proud of um, what we've managed to do uh, in response to an international pandemic, the life of, like of which the global community has not seen for a hundred years. Australia has responded uh, extraordinarily well in so many ways, and I think that the Australian people, as um, as they are. Uh, choose to do so will become vaccinated. And I certainly, again, I would encourage all Australians who are currently eligible for a vaccine to make sure they are using the appropriate websites to register for those vaccines. I went through the Department of Health website to register for my own vaccine uh, through the Western Australian Department of Health uh, website. And I would encourage all my fellow citizens of Western Australia to do so. 
Um, if you are eligible to have a vaccine, you should register, you should get vaccinated. This is the quickest path to continue the very solid foundation we have of recovering from this once in a century global pandemic and uh, getting life as much as possible back to normal as we all want it to as quickly as possible. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, well, <clears throat> Senator Brockman says that he's proud of the Australian government's response. Stone cold, motherless last. Uh, that is where Australia is and the Morrison government is in terms of vaccine schedule and vaccine delivery. And that has real consequences for ordinary Australians and ordinary people. Real consequences in terms of their health, real consequences in terms of the economy. And we've seen from the budget projections of this government that it knows that because of its vaccine failure, there will be at least one citywide lockdown every month for the duration of the financial year. Now, I watched Senator Colbeck's performance answering questions about these issues uh, uh, in, in this afternoon's question time. Now, Senator Colbeck does very much give the impression of a bloke who needs a hand crossing the road. He doesn't inspire confidence. Uh, he doesn't know the answers to basic questions. Um, he doesn't appear to have the capability or the guts to face up to the big issues that face Australia in the vaccine rollout in our response to the pandemic. But Minister Hunt belled the cat in the other place this afternoon when he was asked the question. He confessed that there were discussions with Pfizer in July of last year. Well, why on earth don't we have the proper levels of supply and the right vaccine options, enough vaccine options for Australians to make sure that we're in the right position, that we're not sitting at the bottom of the queue, outside the league tables of the top 100 when it comes to vaccine delivery. In July, the government had it within its grasp to secure enough Pfizer vaccines to vaccinate Australians, but instead, who knows why? Instead, we put all of our eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. And how on earth are we going to get out of this mess? The vaccine rollout catastrophe hurts ordinary Australians. This disease, there will be more of this disease because of the government's vaccine failure. That means more Australians will die uh, of the COVID-19 virus. Others will be disabled. Many, many who didn't need to be ill will be ill. There will be more outbreaks. They will spread faster because of the government's vaccine failure. It will have significant economic impacts and we will be held back in terms of our living standards, in terms of jobs, uh, in terms of economic growth because of the government's failure. Now, ordinary Australians pulled their weight. Ordinary Australians pulled their weight. They deserve a government that actually pulls its weight. Now, we've heard all of the excuses, all of the language designed to deflect and blame others. We even heard the minister representing the health minister, Senator Colbeck, yesterday say that the government was re-pivoting. I mean, what on earth does that mean, a re-pivot? The truth is we've gone from I don't hold a hose, mate, to I don't hold a dose, mate. And Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, is running out of other people to blame. We are in a post-re-pivot analysis now. And the truth is the Prime Minister, when it comes to organising a press conference or a photo opportunity, is always there with bells on. There were 16 press conferences to make announcements over the course of last year and the first part of this year. 7th of September, a big press conference to announce the AstraZeneca deal, hundreds of, uh, of uh, photos, big announcement. The 19th of August, another announcement. 
the 13th of November, another announcement. 16th of November, announced CSL as a local manufacturing site. I think that's where he held up with his Australian flag face mask, an empty vial of vaccine. Well, nothing could more symbolise the jingoism and the announcement before delivery approach of this government than holding up an empty vial at a press conference. All announcement, Thank no you, delivery. Senator Ayres. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy to take note of answers be agreed to. <clears throat> Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. I uh, seek, uh, sorry, I rise to uh, take note of answers uh, to my question to Senator Rustin. Um, while I was waiting for my chance to, to take note, um, I was looking at Senator Birmingham and I just remembered a question I asked in the Senate to Senator Birmingham five years ago, uh, where I read a tweet from Professor Terry Hughes. Uh, one of the world's global uh, coral experts. He just got back from surveying the Great Barrier Reef and he said that his students looked at the survey results and they wept. Um, and of course, Professor Hughes has been a very outspoken uh, advocate for action on climate change because of his connection to the oceans and the Barrier Reef. Well, I won't go into Senator Birmingham's response, but I did want to frame it in the sense that uh, we have one coalition senator in here today talking about or well, quoting John Maynard Keynes, uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. Well, I would ask the coalition senators, surely the facts before us are very obvious, devastating indeed, when you look at the information that's coming through on the changes we've seen in our oceans in just the last five years. Yet their approach to climate change and tackling the greatest challenge of our time hasn't changed at all. Hasn't changed at all. No action except distraction. No action except distraction. Any excuse except to take action. While we've had three mass coral bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef, that's led to 50 per cent loss of coral cover on this greatest, most international global wonder, a wonder you can see from space. While with the majority of the world's coral reefs have suffered even more significant damage from warming oceans, while Tasmania's giant kelp forests have vanished in the last five years, as have many seagrass beds around the country, over a thousand kilometres of mangroves in the Northern Territory and northern Queensland lost from warming oceans in an environment that's already adapted to warm oceans. These are the extreme facts that we need to face. So why aren't we changing our mind? Why is it that our resources minister and prime minister have just given 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans for the oil and gas industry, including some of the world's biggest polluters, to carve up? to blast the hell out of them with seismic surveys, to risk these oceans and their values and their habitats with oil and gas drilling, to get established industrial production at our coastlines. And I asked the minister today whether she accept, accepted the simple established scientific fact that burning fossil fuels leads to more greenhouse gas emissions and more greenhouse gas emissions are directly correlated and causated to warming oceans. And what do we get out of the minister? All she could say is, I'm not a climate denier. Well, that's just not good enough. She could easily be a climate sceptic. I know there are senators in this chamber, like Senator Abetz, that don't call themselves climate deniers. They like to call themselves climate sceptics. Why didn't the minister just come out and say, yes, Senator, that is exactly right. Burning more fossil fuels leads to warming oceans. And warming oceans has led to these catastrophic impacts. And it doesn't matter if we get our emissions under control this week. We've still got 20 years of ocean warming to come from what we've already burnt. That's how dire it is. 
Just, I just want to repeat that for senators. Even if we take radical action, as David Attenborough tells us we have to do, as the Greens have been saying for decades, we still have warming locked into our system. Our oceans absorb 80 per cent of this planet's heat, and they have already absorbed a substantial amount of heat. So that means more changes, more impacts. And yet the minister couldn't answer the concerns of communities. Ocean lovers, surfers, fishers, divers. She couldn't come in here and explain why she's continuing with this insanity of issuing fossil fuel permits for the exact same product that, when it's burnt, is actually killing our oceans. It's the time in history to stop this madness. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Wish Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That concludes that matter. And just before we go to